You're listening to the RE Social Podcast with your hosts, Andrew and Vince from OnV Invest. For more information, go to onvinvest.com. What's up, you guys? Welcome to another episode of RE Social. Today, we have a Chris Miles from Money Ripples. Uh, hey, welcome to the show, man. Hey, it's a pleasure to be on here. Yeah, for people who haven't really you know, gone to your website or read a couple of your books, can you give a 60-second intro about yourself? Yeah, people call me the anti-financial advisor because, well, I think financial advisors suck. That's why. So uh, uh, my, my story is I actually used to be a financial advisor, uh, but I've since reformed because I realized that uh, nobody was becoming financially free just saving and trying to save their way to wealth, especially in mutual funds and gambling in the stock market. But instead, uh, real estate was the thing that's actually been proven to work. And that's what I've been trying to get people to do more of is do more with real estate where it's safer, get better better passive income. In fact, I was able to retire when I was 28 years old because of it. So uh, we're in the financial advisor world. You could you couldn't find somebody who's easily like comfortably retired like that. Uh, why do you say uh, mainstream financial advice uh, sucks? Yeah, I mean, because so for example, like, you know, when I was raised by my dad, he was like the ultra penny pinching saver, you know, the cheap guy that, you know, it wasn't like he didn't wouldn't just not tip if somebody gave bad service. If they gave bad service, he would even steal the plates off the table just to show them how bad it was, right? Like, that's how cheap my dad was. He would steal from waitresses rather than tip them, you know? And uh, and so I was always taught to save money, don't spend anything, and then hopefully that should make your life happy. So naturally, after I went to college and, you know, your mom goes to college, you know, after I do that and, uh, you know, I, I wanted to go into business consulting, but I figured I should have a real life business. And so the first business that came my way that was intriguing was becoming a financial advisor, not realizing they take anybody off the street as long as you can pass a test and not have a criminal record. And so that's what I did. And I went down that path. I ended up staying as an entrepreneur. In fact, I dropped out of college with one class to go before I got my degree just to do that. And so four years in, I'm a financial advisor, right? And then my dad finally says, Chris, when do you become my financial advisor? When are you going to give me some advice? So I sat down with my dad. First time ever in my life I'd ever seen his money because he was always the guy who was afraid to really reveal too much about a situation. And I'm looking at his money and he'd been stuffing money in his 401k forever. He'd been paying off all his debt. He was totally debt free, including his house. He was like the guy that Dave Ramsey would say, there's your model student, right? However, as I looked at all of his money and everything else, I said, Dad, I know you're 61 years old, but if you want to retire today, you better hope you die in five years because that's when you're going to run out of money. Okay, Chris, well, give me something else. What else can I do? I said, I don't know. You did everything right according to what mainstream financial advice teaches, which is spend nothing, save everything, save it forever, let it stock it, you know, sh- you know, stuff it away in the mutual funds and stocks and things like that. And hopefully you have something someday. And it hadn't worked. It didn't work for him. And then a few weeks later, as I'm talking to a friend of mine who was doing real estate investing, he's like, well, how many of your clients are financially free or they don't worry about money? And as I was really honest with myself, I realized even the retired clients that I had, even ones I inherited from decades working with other financial advisors before me, yet they still weren't comfortable in their retirement. They were still worried about running out of money. And I said, well, none. I guess none of them were free. Okay, Chris, how about this? How many of you guys as financial advisors are financially free, not off the commission during, but actually doing these investments that supposedly are supposed to work for people? And again, I had to really be honest with myself. But I said, well, there's guys who've been working here since the late 1970s. This is in 2005, right? I'm like, the guys working here since the late 1970s and they can't retire either. So I'd have to say none. <laughs> and there's your problem, Chris. And, and that's kind of what got me to going down taking the matrix red pill, right? Like going down a different path with real estate investing and actual income, like passive income in that space. You know, the whole alternative investment world, I didn't even know existed. I knew that people could buy rentals, but I didn't know there was so much more to real estate investing beyond just buying a rental property in your backyard. And when I realized like this whole world was open and then I was able to get my money to work harder for me, that's when I got to the point where I said, wait, I have enough income coming in. I don't have to keep working anymore. I'm 28, almost 29 years old. And, and that's the thing that I'm passionate about because I saw it firsthand. You know, I was, I was, I saw the wizard behind the curtain and I'll just tell you, like, it's, it's bleak. It doesn't work. You know, financial advising just doesn't work because they're always telling you to go into this high risk, mediocre returning type of mutual funds that do not pay you 12%, like 
they so claim. Like you get the guys like Dave Ramsey out there telling you, you're going to make 12% a year. Just put away a hundred bucks a month for the next 40 years and you'll be a millionaire. You won't be like, that's just a bunch of BS. And, uh, and that's what's happening is that people are having way less because the market only averages about 8%, not 12. Um, and on top of that, what happens if you get to the close to retirement and the market tanks? Well, you're going to have to wait another five, 10 years before it comes back up before you do it. And that's what happened to my dad, right? Like he had to wait until the seventies till he was forced in retirement before he could actually retire. And that's not what I want for people. I don't want to live a life where you, you keep delaying it for someday, hoping that'll be enough when in truth, it's been proven not to work. Yeah, man, that's uh, yeah, that's a good uh, intro to why you shouldn't listen to financial advices. Now, I want to dig into your timeline real quick. So what, how old were you? I know uh, I saw that you retired twice when you were 28. And how old were you made this realization? So I want to know what happened in those period of time. Yeah, so 2006, I quit being a financial advisor. I vowed I'd never teach about money again. And, uh, and so I was kind of just searching, looking for stuff. And, uh, and so I learned things like lending out your money, like hard money lending, right? Sure. Things like that. Uh, yeah, I, I knew about rentals and do things of that nature or flips and whatnot. Uh, and, and, and I didn't really need a lot of money back then. I had really two kids in 2006. You know, I have eight now with a blended family. So uh, my, my Brady Bunch is, is huge at this point. But, uh, but back then, I only needed 3500 a month. And so it wasn't hard to do to get enough passive income coming in to hit 3500 a month, right? Um, and so that's how I did it the first time. Now, what? So, real quick. So basically, uh, mm-hmm. sorry uh, to cut you off, but basically you had like $350,000 of savings and you're lending it at 10% or something. So you're making 35000 a year. Is that kind of like your first start at financial freedom? Yeah. If I wasn't making more, I mean, some okay, of the hard money good. lending was even paying better than that. Yeah, right. Okay. So um, a little bit too rich in some cases, which is why we, the recession hurt so bad for real estate investors, mm-hmm. uh, which is why I had to do it twice. Okay. Cause uh, you know, the first time I did it, but if, if, if I had to do it twice, it's cause I screwed up the first time. And so uh, when the recession hit, you know, all of a sudden the passive income stream started drying up. Uh, even my rentals weren't doing as great anymore. Uh, so all this kind of stuff just started happening. Uh, one of the one of the properties is my rental was actually a starter home I had, I had purchased, and then it's turned into a rental. You know, so things like that, right? But um, I mean, really, like the the recession taught me a lot. You know, it taught me, you know, really stay liquid. Um, also, track your money, and don't put all your money in your house. That's one thing it taught me for sure. Like, don't try to trap all your money in equity. Because uh, that's that's one thing I thought, because I was a mortgage broker that time, too. And I figured if I ever want to get money out of my house, just, you know, get a HELOC, right? Or just do a cash out refinance. The banks will give me money because they at that, in 2006, they would lend money to anybody. But starting in 2007, they stopped lending money to real estate investors and to business owners, which I was both. And uh, and that was a big epiphany. Um, that was that was one of the reasons why I think sometimes people when they listen to guys like Dave Ramsey, they're really uh, if they listen to them beyond just like, you know, budgeting advice and things like that, they could really screw themselves and shoot themselves in the foot if they do that kind of thing. So um, I definitely recommend don't lock your way, lock away your money in prison. Don't keep it in pr- equity in your properties. Don't, you know, don't have it in places where you can't get it. Lock it up in 401ks. I mean, that's that's the big mistake that everybody's making right now because financial advisors are paid to tell you to do that stuff. Right. And that's and that's dangerous. That's dangerous advice to to take. So what would you be, you know, we talked about some of the stuff that is um, not good, not what you want to do. So let's say, you know, people listening, they're making $70,000 a year and they can save, you know, let's say 10 to 20 grand per year. They're very frugal. What do you, what would you advise them? Like, what, do, what do people have to do to start? Start investing? You know, it depends. I mean, if they don't have any savings at all, you know, you can start with just a simple savings account, right? Okay. Just start to build up that savings. Don't take every dollar you have and try to invest it. Because the truth is, and this is my opinion, is I'm not saying it's it's always right, but if, if you don't have at least a hundred grand, don't worry about it. <laughs> like just build up to that point. Um, what, one strategy I teach a lot of our, our clients, like we talk about, like, you know, people have talked about maybe on your show, even like infinite banking, uh, which uh, can be good. But most of the time when you hear those guys teach it, they're just insurance agents trying to, in a lot of cases, rip you off, right? Um, and you want to be careful of that. But uh, I use a strategy I refer to as max ROI infinite banking, where I use a life insurance policy, the, the cash tax-free savings account in there that will pay me better than the bank. It's also tax-free. 
and I'll actually keep my money there. I'll keep my money, you know, in that place to build it up. And so we get people that are just starting off and they're like, hey, I've got maybe, you know, 10,000 a year or so I can save. That's a great strategy to employ right now. And then as you start to get more than just your emergency fund set up in place, because you've got to have an emergency fund of at least six months of expenses in place first before you ever worry about investing. Get that going first, then build up the cash, and then you can start investing. So where would you recommend once they have some money, let's say they got you know six months saved up, 50 grand or 100 grand? Yeah, once you get beyond that point, like I said, you get above 100 grand, but then it, it kind of opens up to options. And I would just say this, it's like, go with the option you understand. Right. I mean, there's so many different things you can do in the real estate space. I mean, you could do rentals, but but be careful because, like, for example, I live in the western half of the United States. Um, I wouldn't dare buy a rental out here. You know, like I, I think it, like prices are way too high. Rents are way too low. But I can go, go look out east, like towards like I've got rentals like in Tennessee. I've got rentals like North Carolina and places like that where I can make a much better return, cash on cash return on my money. And so if you've got at least. Thirty, forty thousand dollars. You've got a down payment for a house, right? Uh, and it doesn't have to be that. I mean, it might just be something as simple as. I mean, there's there's funds. I mean, depending if you're, if you're not an accredited investor, you know, maybe you're not accredited. You know, where you don't have at least a million dollars of net worth, not including your house, or you don't uh, have at least you're not making at least two or three hundred thousand a year. You know, then there's even funds out there that might have you know a small you know small minimum. Maybe it's like twenty five thousand bucks. Sometimes they're a thousand bucks, depending on where you're looking. Um, it might just be like a debt fund, you know, where you're lending your money, you're putting their money to their fund where they go and lend it out and make money off that. I mean, there's a lot of options there. I, I would definitely stay away from things like fundrise type stuff. I mean, definitely don't be uh, putting your money into the place where like they're loaning it to people buying cars or doing business loans. You know, that's kind of risky. Uh, but I would definitely say look at investments that have some sort of asset backing up like real estate, something real, something tangible, you know. So that's that's where I would start. I mean, again, start with where you know. Don't just try to invest in a place you have no no knowledge in or no business doing. It's kind of like a lot of my, you know, I have a lot of friends that like start talking about Bitcoin, you know, or even some of our clients are like, hey, should I do Bitcoin? Well, why would you do Bitcoin? I don't know. Just everybody talks about it. Well, if everybody's talking about it, that's the exact wrong time to get into Bitcoin. Because when idiots start talking about, about any kind of investment, that's the time that's going to drop, you know? So you get in, at, you know, before it gets hot, not after it's hot, you know, those kind of things. So. So that's that's where I kind of tell people is like, hey, listen, once you start to build it up, start with something. But if you're going to go with anything, I think the safest place is go with a rental, but go with a rental that really cash flows. And it might require you, you know, doing, you know, you could do like a burst strategy, of course, right? You could always actually do something that is in your area, uh, but you got to be careful, of course, in that in that situation. Um, you could buy a rental somewhere else. Um, if I buy a rental somewhere else, I don't want to be the property manager because I suck at it. So I usually do what's called turnkey real estate where I go to a turnkey real estate company, they have the properties already there on a silver platter, ready to buy, um, that you even know the cash flow going in, what's going to be, and then I'll buy it. And in fact, when I, when I got burned in real estate and came back, that was the first strategy I started doing again, was the one that kind of got my faith back up. Because uh, I realized in my own journey, my own real estate, I was a horrible property manager. I, was, I went for every sob story that the renters would give me, and I wasn't collecting rent very well, right? Um, when I use a turnkey provider where they have their own property manager doing that kind of work, I am literally just collecting the checks and I'm kind of that distance away from the, from the renter. Not only do I have a property that's mine, I can still control it and have multiple exit strategies, but it's a cash flowing property. It's a real asset. It's going to be one of the safer things I can do uh, versus put my money with somebody where they might lose it, you know, because you can lend money to people and that's an easy strategy, but you got to be very, very careful who you invest with when you do those kind of investments. And how do you screen for that if you're going to lend money to somebody, hard money? Yeah, I mean, the best way to screen, of course, is through referral, in my opinion. Um, knowing the right kind of groups and circles. I've noticed that birds of a feather flock together. Uh, like when I go to certain mastermind groups, I notice that we tend to show up in the same places, right? Um, first and foremost, if you're, if you're somebody who's kind of lacking integrity in your own life, you're probably going to attract other investors that lack integrity, right? So... Start with you first and foremost. Are you honest? Are you really forthright in how you do things? Because if you are, you'll notice that you tend to attract people just like you, right? So uh, I see some people like they're really big gamblers. They really want to get rich quick. And then they get suckered into every single get rich quick scheme available out there, right? Um, they get suckered by people out there just teaching you like, here's how you get rich off real estate. When in truth, 
they out there, they're just pulling your leg or ripping you off. Right. Um, so that's where I start. I start with me, like check my heart, check myself before I wreck myself, you know, start there. But then, you know, like I said, go for referrals, go for people that also, that also have integrity, right? Who do they trust? Who do they go to? Cause it's either you create your own network or you borrow somebody else's, right? It's like, I've created my own network for my own clients that we've kind of vetted. It doesn't mean it's guaranteed, but I know these people have great track records. Like I invest with people. I, I, I only want to invest with people that have at least 15 years of experience in real estate. You know, I want, I want the people that got their teeth kicked in, in the last recession. You know, I want people that have been through like a full market cycle. They've been through the boom times and the bust times. Mm -hmm. And so they know how to pivot and move when things happen to change in real estate. And so I look for track record first and foremost. Um, I, I want to see that they've lost hair or got more gray hairs because of the, the mistakes they made. Yeah. Um, I also want to see people that, um, you know, that also like, even if, if times were tough, like I want to know what the worst deal was. So a great question could be is, Hey, tell me about your worst real estate deal. What happened? You know, what'd you learn from it? Did you pay people back or did you go bankrupt? Right? Like that kind of thing. And even if somebody did go bankrupt. Okay, great. Did you really learn a lesson from it that will keep prevent you from doing that again? You know, that's the kind of thing I want to know. I don't care about the people that told me, Hey, I started investing in 2019 and I've made great money since then. Like that, I mean, everybody and their dog made money in real estate in like 2018 and 2019, you know? Um, I want people that, of course, figure out how to make it make money in that when others didn't. So, um, so that's kind of what I look for. Of course, uh, I also look for like if I'm lending money to somebody, I want to make sure that I'm uh, I have some sort of collateral, just like the bank. I mean, think about what a bank does for you. I mean, a bank when you try to go in for a loan, they don't necessarily want to give you a credit card right off the bat, do they? I mean, they might, but they're going to give you something very small. But for the most part, they're going to lend based on having some sort of collateral. You know, do you have a, you get a car loan, they use that car as collateral. Even if it depreciates, they still know it has something there. Um, they give you a house loan, right? They give you a mortgage that has collateral behind it. You know, that sort of thing. Even if they do, a, if you do a business loan with a bank, man, they will pull your pants down, metaphorically speaking, of course, not mm -hmm. in reality, you know, but they'll, they'll literally just pull down your financial pants and want to look at everything. You know, they want to do a full analysis and they might still deny you. Because they don't have real collateral. They're banking on cash flow, right? You should be doing that same kind of due diligence on the people you invest with. You should be looking at them just like a bank looks at you. You know, you want to look at their financials, right? You want to know, like, like for example, there's somebody that came, that came to us. They said, hey, we want to get to your clients. You know, we want to see if we could be an option for you. And I said, all right, great. You got some track record. That's awesome. You've been doing the same type of investing. That's another thing I like too. They've stayed kind of in their lane for a long time. Not like they they changed gears recently and now they're experimenting with another strategy. I don't want to be their guinea pig, right? But they've been in that lane. This this particular company, they were in their lane. They've done their their business for a while. They have a good model, and uh, and they even have like very like specific buy box check marks that they go through, right? Um, but the big thing I was asking is, okay, but what about reserves? Like, how much do you have in reserves in your company right now? And they said, oh, we've got fifteen million in reserves right now. Okay, great. Is that just for the company or are you going to take it to run? <laughs> you know, um, do you have those good reserves? And then, and then I even asked them, do you have equity? You know, do you have equity in that? Just like a bank asks you, right? Like what kind of down payment are you putting in this? How much equity is on this property? Do you have equity? Well, yeah, in their case, because they were developing land to uh, do a build a rent model. And they're like, yeah, right from the get go, like we already use our own money to buy the land. We just borrow money from people to do the construction. And by the time we rezone the land and everything else, we have at least 50% equity. And so say, okay, that's good. Like, that means we've got some equity in these properties right from the get-go. Again, like I want collateral. If I'm lending money just for a specific property, I don't want to go over much over like 65, 70% loan to value, right? I want to make sure that if it's worth 300,000, I'm not loaning much more than 200,000 on that property. So if anything goes wrong and I'm on title, right? Like I'm in first position, first trust position, I can claim that property. I don't want to, just like a bank doesn't want to claim that property, right? But I got at least something to back me up that's worth more than when I lent them that money. So looking for equity, right? Looking for track record, looking to see if they've got good financials and reserves. Are they good management? Um, be careful of companies that are really, really big. They have a lot of employees. Uh, I've watched since 2022, especially the ones that went too big too fast were the fastest ones to just drop like a rock and go broke. So you want, you want, I, I like, I actually prefer companies that are kind of like lean, mean machines, you know? And so that's how you got your start into financial freedom was 
Hard money lending. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Hard money lending and rentals is how I started. So let's, let's pivot to rentals and talk about mm-hmm. that, your due diligence process. Let's start with how do you even, you know, get privy to rentals and, and real estate in general? Well, it was like the easiest one to, to, to imagine, right? You know, from, remember, I was a financial advisor. I used to tell people that real estate was a ripoff, you know, like, like you don't make any money in real estate. Appreciation only averages like 4% a year, but the stock market averages 12% a year. So that's the place to be, you know? Um, basically, I was that financial advisor you probably hated. And, uh, and rightfully so, because we're full of crap. Um, and so when I started looking at real estate, I realized it wasn't about the appreciation and where you make the money. I started to realize like, hey, if I could put, you know, and back then it was even better, right? I could put it down like five, 10 percent, you know, now it's 20 percent. But even now, if I put 20 percent down on a property and that property appreciates five percent, I don't make a five percent return because I'm leveraging, you know, five times the money or one fifth of that money. That five percent appreciation becomes a 25 percent return on my money. Right. And, and that was the thing that woke me up. I remember listening to real estate investor the first time and he used the example. He said. Well, if you've got you know a two hundred thousand dollar property, you put twenty percent down, that's forty thousand. Well, if it appreciates five percent on two hundred thousand, that's ten thousand bucks. But that's not five percent, guys. Is like, look, five percent? No, that's ten thousand of your forty. That's a twenty five percent return, not including the rent you get, not including the tax benefits, not including the fact that your renters are paying down your mortgage for you. So even if you didn't get any appreciation between the cash and cash return. And the, the mortgage being paid down, you've got this like guaranteed return. Now, I shouldn't say guaranteed, right? But uh, more of a more of certain return than just banking on appreciation. Uh, appreciation really should be the icing on the cake. Um, so when I when I started to see that, and again, I started to see what was possible, right? Because I mean, you guys know, I mean, if you if you have a rental, and it's not like this as easily right anymore, but if you have a rental that pays you one percent a month, you know, and you put Forty thousand dollars down. You want to make four hundred bucks a month profit. Where can you find an investment where you're not liquidating it, but still getting that one percent a month? Right. You don't. You don't find that in the stock market at all. Because here, here's what I taught. Like uh, when I was a financial advisor, I would tell people if you happen to save up a million dollars, you can live on three percent. The four percent rule is like old stuff. That's from like the 1970s. There's still idiots out there teaching this stuff now, saying there's a four percent rule especially the fire movement, right? The whole financially independent retire early. There is the 4% rule that doesn't work. It's a 2% rule if you're trying to retire early. So I would tell people in retirement, 3%. Well, do the math. 3% of a million bucks is 30,000 a year. So when I was in my financial advisor role, thinking about them pulling out 3%, I thought, man, that's not much. And I would get depressed because when I started to show real rates of return in the stock market, being closer to 8%, if you're lucky, and then I started, you know, taking out taxes and everything else, and you factor in inflation, which most financial advisors don't even want to show that because it gets depressing. What you'll start to find out is anybody who puts money in a 401k, even if they get a match, whatever you put in per year after inflation is what you live on per year in retirement. So if you put in, if you're max funding your 401k of over 20,000 a year, you're going to live on about 20,000 a year lifestyle down the road. But imagine like how surprised I was when Someone said, well, no, you could take a million bucks. You get paid 1% a month. You're getting paid $10,000 a month, not 30,000 a year. And then you pay taxes, 10,000 a month. And you might even keep most of it because of tax benefits. Like it, for me, it just blew up my entire world. And, and that's, and that's kind of what happened for me, right? That's why I started looking at rentals differently than I did. Um, again, like I said, rentals like cash and cash returns are doing great right now. But I do think here in 2024, you're going to see an appreciation bump again, like one that everybody keeps saying it won't happen. I think it will, especially if rates stay low or stay about as low as they are now. If they go a lot higher, I could see it going the opposite direction, maybe, or just flattening out. But we see rates go lower, like you see mortgage rates go down, stay below 7%. You're going to watch millions of people rushing to buy properties and boosting your appreciation. Really, the best time to buy the property is right now when people are competing right now. Well, there's not these competing offers. Yeah, that's what I tell everybody. Everyone cries when the rates went up. I'm uh-huh. like, perfect. You can afford it now when they go back down. You refinance and yeah. you have less competition. You have better terms. I mean, not so long ago, people were offering to name their firstborn after the, uh, <laughs> the seller. <laughs> you remember that? That was a real thing. That was a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And now it's yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah, well, now it's quite flipped. Yeah, it is. Like I, I just actually just on my own podcast, I had a mortgage broker on and uh I asked him, I said, Hey, like, what are some options for people? Like if they're worried about the rates going down and they're holding off buying real estate investments right now, what would you do? He said, Well, there's plenty of programs right now, they'll actually let you do a refi for free, like just a simple rate and term refi down the road. So that's the cool thing is like, you know, some of them will have it fixed for a certain period of time, like, you know, maybe a certain number of years you have the rate fixed, you know, and then it might go up a certain percentage each year for a few years, but you get a little discount. Like, so some of them, you might be, you start at seven and a half, maybe, but it starts at five and a half year one, six and a half year two, then seven and a half year three. But if the rates go down, they'll let you refinance with no extra fees, right? So you know you don't lose because if the rates do go down, great, you just refinance, you're done, and no harm, no foul. But if rates go up, you look like a rock star because then you're like, well, rates are even higher. Maybe they're nine and a half percent. I'm not saying they're gonna do that, but say they did. Well, great, at least they got seven and a half. I feel grateful. Like it's a really a win-win situation when you look at it. But the reason it's not a win-win is because there's so many people in the media right now telling you it's a bad time to buy. Right. And what I've learned is whatever the media says. Do the opposite. If the media yeah. tells you it's a bad time to buy, that's usually the best time to buy because everybody else is believing them. When the media tells you, oh, this is the thing to buy, this is the thing to invest in, that's when you know you should be selling that thing. Like if you're trying to buy in at that point, that's where the dumb money goes in. And that's when people lose all their money. That's the, what gamblers do. They follow the, the hot tips from the media or from the brother in law down, you know, then their family that took that one economic class and says he's smart. Uh, true story. That was actually my brother-in-law or ex-brother-in-law now, you know, but like those kind of people are just idiots. Like they really don't know what's going on. And so if you hear everybody telling you to do one thing, you should be doing the opposite and you're more likely to be right than anything. I believe that's a Warren Buffett quote as well in some way. He yeah. Said it way more eloquently than I could even paraphrase, but yeah, that's in general, I would say in life advice that I give uh, you know, younger generations uh, in that I say, you know what, um, really do your own homework on everything from, mm-hmm. you know, medical advice to health and nutrition. Why is it weirder to walk down the street with a carrot than it is a Snickers? Think about it. Close your eyes and think about it. It's we, the guy with a carrot's like, what the heck? The guy with the Snickers is like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You, you know, like, do you see like even us, even knowing that it's like we're still a victim to it, we're surrounded by it. And yeah, on the news, of course. Uh, you know, it's to hype up and uh, everything's a crisis and the rates went up a half a point. Now all of a sudden it's don't yeah, buy now. Yeah. Sales, doesn't it? yeah. And that's, well, that's it never affected us. We've always just kept buying and just dealt with whatever was happening. And of course, pivot and, and, and make it. Yeah. Way forward. Yeah. You think about the media. I mean, like they try, they're just trying to sell fear or sell something that's newsworthy. If it's yeah. not newsworthy, they don't want it because they want your clicks. They want your right. eyeballs on their stuff as long as possible, right? Yeah, they don't care about well, you. Yeah, they don't care about you. So, mm-hmm. of course, they're going to talk about the hot markets like Phoenix, Arizona or Tampa, Florida, right? They're going to talk about those markets because there's actually something to report. But they're not going to give a crap about like we're just talking about before we went on the air, like, like Gatlinburg, Tennessee, right? You know, they don't give a crap. Like there's nothing, you know, if they don't see anything going on, they're not going to report it. But there's literally thousands of markets in, in just the United States alone. Uh, even when I talk to people that are like from Australia, they'll say, well, you know, is, isn't real estate too hot in, in the United States? I said, well, where? I mean, exactly. yeah, there are hot markets, but there's so many boring markets. And to me, boring is sexy, right? Yeah. Like the ones that nobody cares about, yep. those are the perfect places to be. And there's just so many markets to choose from in the United States that it, it makes it to where if someone says, is there a bad time to buy real estate? It Not really. Like there's a bad time to buy in certain places, but that's not always the case. It's not that way nationwide. And that's, that's the beauty of real estate because people, I used to teach that in about stocks. I used to teach that with mutual funds, like, oh, there's always a sector going up, you know, but that's not always the case. There might be like, I remember 2022, oil and gas is the only thing that went up in 2022. Everything else, like other than utilities and oil and gas tanked, even bonds tanked. And everybody thinks bonds are the safe place to be, right? But in real estate, it's not really that way. Like you really, and, and let's be honest, like the values are great, but do we really care about the values or do we care about the profit? Do we care about the cash flow? Like we want the income. That's what we really care about. And how do you choose your market? We're talking a lot about like the area. What are some of your 
What's some of your criteria for that? Have you thought about investing in real estate and taking advantage of all of those benefits without any of the work? That is something that Onvi Invest not only provides, but has been providing since its inception. With friends and family, we have built an empire in a system of a wealth generating tool that is giving us and our friends and family that leverage in their life to create true wealth. Go to onvinvest.com for more to see if you qualify. And thanks for listening. Yeah, one is I don't want a one horse town, right? You you definitely want an area that's diversified with jobs, you know, like like for example, you know, Detroit is, you know, I had somebody talking to me about Detroit recently and I said, "Well, okay, I know Detroit's diversified outside the automotive industry, but I don't know. I'm still not a fan of Detroit yet. You know, uh, I would have to see a little bit more diversity. Las Vegas. I mean, that's that one always makes the news because it's freaking either it gets hot or cold because it literally is a one horse town. If it didn't have gambling, nobody would care about Vegas. Right. So I stay away from those kind of places. I stay away from the hot markets. You know, when I started seeing Phoenix boom in 2020 and 2021, and I saw a bunch of friends trying to go in and buy up multifamily there, I was like, I'm staying out like that. Like everybody's rushing to Arizona, even from California, like that. This is going to be, this is going to get really hot fast and it's going to get cold really fast. And it did. Almost every deal I've heard in, in Phoenix has gone cold, you know, and, and or even gone south for that matter. And a lot of them even went bankrupt. So I stay away from that. So, so I'm just, I'm really looking for like the boring markets. Like when I hear about Arkansas, I'm like, well, that sounds pretty dang sexy. You know, not because Bill Clinton was there, you know, but, mm -hmm. you know, because nobody talks about Arkansas, you know, yeah. and it's still a landlord friendly state. That's another thing. It's like you want it to be a landlord friendly state. Um, I was talking to one of my employees just just a little while before we recorded this. And, you know, she she lives right on the Illinois and Iowa border. Now, granted, like Iowa is not like the coolest place in the world, you know, but when it comes to rentals, and even with multifamily, it's a heck of a lot better on the Iowa side than Illinois, Illinois. Good luck of evicting any any tenants out of there, right? They, they know how to, to milk you and play the game. Where in Iowa, you got 30 days. You better get out. So look for those states that, you know, to, you know, it doesn't matter how political you are, right? That tend to be more the red states, that tend to be more the landlord friendly states. Look for those kind of states and then find a market there. But again, you know, I, I think the best way to do that, if you're looking at other markets outside of where you live, find someone in those areas, find someone who really knows that market and and use and leverage them. Wow. You're just fire hosing whoever's listening with value. That's you actually touching on a lot of things. We're, we're going to be doing a, uh, a group class to help mm -hmm. people get into their first deal and or second or third deal, but just to make the right moves. Essentially it's like the playbook that we would have paid thousands for. Uh, yeah. And you're touching on like a lot of the highlights right now. Um, well, I better shut up then. No dude, more, no, no more, no more value for you guys. Need to stop. <laughs> bring it out. You know we're gonna shut this episode down. Yeah, we gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> He's giving away way too many secrets. But yeah, if you're listening, you know, wow, just to quickly dissect the bullet points. You know, there's a reason why you know you became retired before 30. That's for darn sure you're smart. You know, so what he's saying is, get into those markets where. You know, you, it's the the tenants don't have so many rights that it takes you nine months to get them out. True story. Yeah. Gone through that. Um, multiple times. Multiple times. Yeah. It's been kind of California. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We start in California. That's where we live, you know. And so long story short, you know, look for those. And I always say, I always actually preface it. Even last night we had our meetup. Hey, I'm not like a politics guy. I barely follow it. I don't really watch the news. But I'm all about my red states. It's because I've just been burned so hard on the blue states. You know, we've lost yeah. tens of thousands, over $100,000 on just having tenant issues itself. And, uh, and, and no mas. <laughs> now we're going into those boring markets. We're finding red states where it's just a maybe, you know, secondary tertiary market out of something that everyone talks about and is exploding. Cool. We'll take the growth outside of that. And it's been wonderful for us. And that's kind of what we're giving away is well, not giving, we're actually selling the course, but um, that's what I'm excited to talk about and help people to discover because it's essentially like any business advice. I would always say, Hey man, educate yourself with mentors and books and prepare for the worst. 
prepare and save for the worst case scenario. Like you're saying, having a, um, you know, six months reserves. Wonderful. That's start there, you know, yeah. because things happen, but hope for the best and, 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 and try to play it that way. But you just gotta, you gotta make sure that you're protected. And so even if you got the best management, the best due diligence, the right tenant will make you a ton of money and a, you know, a, be the best thing ever. And just one bad tenant, you know, can really cause a lot of heartache. Uh, and that's what we've gone through in blue states such as California, not knocking California. I love it here. I probably will never move, but I'm just going to put it out there. Most of my money is going into red states for sure. For sure. Well, I've got clients that got properties. I mean, anywhere in the West Coast, the three states there, Oregon, Washington, and California, right? I mean, I've got one client with or- in Oregon where if somebody squats in your house, you can't do anything. Like you literally have to let them squat there. You know, like that, that to me is just robbery, right? Like where's the human rights for the landlord, right? You know, like yeah. it, I don't care what somebody might think is like, oh, they're rich. Like there's so many people that are middle class that try to own property to try to make money off of those things and go broke because of things like that, you know? So that's, that's just robbery. And so I agree with you. Like, and, and you even said something I, I didn't even say myself, but like those church area markets, right? Like not going for the big city necessarily. It's like the suburbs, you know, or like the smaller cities, mm-hmm. like they just get overlooked so often, but those can be some of the better, best places to invest, you know, but, but that's where, again, like you guys, you know, you're, you're, you're investing from a distance, you know, you're investing in different areas too, for that reason. And, and, uh, and you, you know what it's like, granted, I mean, it's, you know, granted, um, we, we didn't even start going out of state until about four or five years into our journey. So, mm-hmm. you know, once you've seen the machine in action, you know, all the, the cogs and the parts, it's just a copy paste anywhere. I could, we could do this anywhere in the world. Well, it, I'll say anywhere in the United States, because you know what pieces need to go where. And as long as you have those, um, you don't need yeah. to be there. You know, in fact, I would say. Uh, you know, to the person listening, who's like, no, I want to be there. If I got to fix the toilet, like I'm going to be that Mm -hmm. guy. First of all, you're probably going to do a a piss poor job um, Mm -hmm. compared to the guy who's that's all he does is fix the toilets, call the guy, (laughs) get it done. Keep him on your Rolodex and then call two more guys to have a B and a C team. There's another freebie right there. You know, have a deep Rolodex of vendors and, uh, and just be prepared for the worst, you know, have that budget set aside. Yeah, you said exactly where I was going with that too. Is you kind of have to decide if you want to be more of an active investor or a passive investor, right? Right. And if you've got the time, you know, being an active investor is way more. It can be way more profitable. There's a lot more headaches too, but mm-hmm. you can make a lot more money faster being an active investor. However, if you feel kind of overloaded on time already, then being a passive investor or connecting with people that are active investors tend to be a better way to go. And that's yep. the way I chose. Not because I didn't have the time, because you know I, I do. But I just didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be the active investor anymore. I didn't want to have to like create a whole new business in that sense. And so I'd rather get my money working for me. And that's the thing. If you don't exchange your own time and energy, you exchange money. And so like, like, for example, like now I've kind of broadened my, you know, diversified, so to speak, my holdings, right? Like, like I don't just have rentals. I don't just, you know, do lending, which those are great too. But now like I even have like oil and gas, you know, like mineral rights, you know, where, you know, buying like the, the basin of West Texas, you know, have ownership in land. When they drill the natural gas and the oil, you get paid on that, you know? So I've got things like that. I've got raw land, like a partnership where I don't do the raw land because that to me is mind numbing. But I have a partner that they do the raw land investing. They buy the properties. They sell, they sell them on terms. You know, they sell or finance them to other people and they're paying the mortgage note. And I mean, so far, like four hundred thousand dollars have invested. It's paying me almost ten thousand a month. You know, like that kind of stuff. Like that. That's kind of stuff I now do. Right? It's like now I'm like, how do I partner with somebody who wants to be the active investor, or I'll be the financer? And you just have to decide which one you want to be. Do you want to exchange time and energy, or do you would you rather exchange the money? One of them's got to be exchanged if you want to get the right returns. Yeah, I was just uh, lightly coaching a complete newbie. Um, who really wants to get in her first deal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was just like, well, you got to find your value, you know, cause she had it in her mind that she's got to save, you know, all this money for the down payment. I'm like, yeah, that's one way to, to do it. Or you could find the deal or you could manage the deal or you could, you know, whatever. Like there's a lot of ways to add value. 
Um, but uh, people yeah. just don't know about it. So, you know, we've been lucky to be mentors and we're actually kind of working on a book right now to kind of save people the headache that we'd gone through the past six years. And, you know, yeah. we're kind of really hitting our stride in terms of strategy, team, everything like, you know, and uh, now we're just, you know, trying to put that out there and, and help the next guy, help the uh, those who are just getting started. Um, and I wanted to, I'm kind of saying all that to actually bring it back to you. <laughs> you said invest in, you know, once you get to six months, once you get some, you know, a chunk of change for investing, um, you said invest in what you know. So how did you learn about real estate, not just real estate as an asset and the benefits, but how to make it work, like how to do it successfully? Because that's, it's not easy to pull off. So how did, what was that journey like for you educationally? I was curious about that. Well, I think you kind of alluded to it. It's that power in partnerships, right? Who can you partner with? Because I think the best way to do it is either find a mentor to help you do it, like walk alongside you in that. And like you said, find the value. Like, is there something you can exchange with them to make the deal make sense for them? And you can walk alongside them and learn as you go. Um, or like I do, like I use the money and let somebody else, you know, do all, deal with all the headaches and stuff, right? Yeah. It, it, you have to really you know, figure out where it is. But yeah, if you want to learn, I mean, I think that's the right way to do. I mean, right way to go. Uh, another thing is and maybe you guys offer this as well, where like you said, that you've, you've uh, you know, you might have had meetups, right? It could be meetups or RIA groups. Uh, granted, I'm not saying everybody in RIA group you should listen to, right? Because there's a lot of people just trying to figure it out themselves. They're just learning. But just getting around, surrounding yourself with those people, right? That's the power of partnerships is that you can be around the right people. You can learn it. Sometimes you'll just learn it because you're in those conversations. You hear it so often, you learn more. Like, like I've never done really, okay, I kind of did like some wholesaling deals. I didn't realize it was wholesaling, but I kind of like did little deals. I was helping people like buying and selling for investors a few times, like back before the last recession. But, you know, I, I don't know the first thing about a wholesaling business. But having been in mastermind groups that I, I invest in, I mean, I'm with a bunch of wholesalers. I feel like I know I know a lot about wholesaling now. I would never want to do it, right? I would never want to do wholesaling either. But uh, but you kind of get around those people enough and you start to understand their language and the things that they're looking for. You start to hear about things like skip tracing, all that kind of stuff. Like I had never known what that was when I first heard those terms. But being in those 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 groups, right? that's where you get to learn that stuff. And then you can kind of decide, is this for me or not? You know, that's the best thing to do is just get around those people that are actually doing that. I, I love when I look for mentors, I like for people that have been there, done that, and then still doing it today. Yeah. Right. Not just the been there, done that people, right. We don't want the people that were awesome 20 years ago, but they're like right. Uncle Rico and Napoleon Dynamite. They could throw a football over those mountains. Right. We don't want that. We want somebody who actually is still able to do it today right. because if things change in the market, they know how to adjust with it. They know how to teach you those those key things that can help you progress and and build off of the mistakes, just like you guys do with the book, right? Like you're teaching them all the things that you had learned, at least as much as you can within that scope, so that they can actually take it and have a leg up and get there. Yep, education is everything. You know, the smarter you get, the uh, the less you'll work and the more money you'll make. You know, that's been our experience. So. Dennis, yeah. what do you think, man? Yeah, hey Chris, a couple of questions. Um, did you uh, did you keep all of the rentals, or did you sell most of it during the pandemic? How many do you have now? Yeah, I was still buying during a little after the pandemic, but then I stopped, um, and now I still have some, even from pre-pandemic days. But uh, but I actually sold some. Um, I mean, speaking of states, I mean, I I realized I don't like the state of Alabama. No offense to anybody who lives in Alabama, right? But you know, after dealing with crappy property managers and dishonest people there. And then realizing that even if you try to call for utility services, you're like, man, you guys, you use computer? Like, come on guys, like get, <laughs> catch up. You know, you start to realize like, oh, I don't like this area as much. So like we end up selling off two of our Alabama properties, you know, in Tuscaloosa just a few months back, you know? And so, so we still have some, but uh, that we've held on to that are really cash flowing amazingly well and probably won't cash flow that great again. But uh, I do I do do this. I'm always analyzing my return on equity. Um, this is one big mistake I see a lot of real estate investors make is that they buy rentals. And then it's not just from the market highs or anything like that, trying to buy once, you know, sell once high or whatnot. But even just look at how much equity you have in the property. What's the actual ROI of your equity? Uh, for example, I had a client, speaking of California, he was out in San Diego. 
And uh, he, he had this property. It was his very first duplex he ever bought. He was married to it, emotionally married to it, did not want to let it go. And I'm looking at it. I said, hey, okay, tell me, how much cash flow are you making this? Net profit, 200 bucks a month. Okay. Well, what are you trying to do with it? Well, I'm going to spend the next six years to pay off my mortgage, and then I'll make 2400 a month. So he was just blinders on. Dave Ramsey did it. Right? He's like, I'm just going to freaking pay this, this debt off, and then I'll have 2400 a month. And I said, yeah, but I'm analyzing this right now. You've got 700000 of equity in this property. That means at 200 bucks a month, you've got like a 0.3% return on equity because 2400 divided by 700000 is jack squat, right? I said, you can sell this. 1035 of the equity into other properties, especially out east, more direction like where you guys are investing, and you'll make a much better return. And he's like, ah, I can't do it. I, I, my wife won't let me do it, right? Two years later, he finally got the guts to do it. He just sent me an email a few months ago and he says, Chris, guess what? I just bought my sixth property in Louisiana. I'm cash flowing $8,300 a month. Guys, he went from 200 a month and hoping to get to 2,400 a month after six years. Now it's only five years later. He's not even at the sixth year. And he's already cash flowing 100 grand a year versus trying to get up to like 29 grand a year. You know, like that's the difference. So analyze that. Like if, you're, if you've got properties right now, even if it's one you think is amazing because it's good from when you bought it, but it may not be good if you look at the equity and what's sitting there. Again, that's money trapped in prison that if you get it out, that could actually change your life. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to look at it too. Unless his uh, the last two years he went up from seven hundred to three million in equity, then his game has changed, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the only difference with the appreciating markets. But I, I do agree. I want to ask a couple of questions uh, before we let you go. Is you know I know you mentioned that um, in your book or somewhere I read that it did say that you are your approach from rich dad poor dad is slightly different. Most people who come to the game um, have come with rich dad poor dad. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, like Rich Dad Poor Dad is always a great book, right? I mean, how many of us could say that was like our start, you know, yeah. that opened our eyes? I mean, the, here's the sad thing. As a financial advisor, I thought they actually supported what I taught. You know, I don't know why, but... Uh, <laughs> he does know, not. He's, he's trashing you the whole time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he does. Well, yeah. and if you ever read the book, Who Took My Money? If you don't like, if you don't hate mutual funds, you will after reading that book. <laughs> that's the one that I read that got me into that in 2006, got me out of being a financial advisor. Um, but you know, like, it, you know, again, like, so not taking away anything that he shows there, but I mean, he has a very good simplistic view of, of how things work, but I've watched a lot of people and maybe you have two where they just think, oh, well he invests in oil. I should invest in oil or he invests in real estate. I should invest in real estate. Right. And it's not the strategy. The thing you should really focus on from those books is the mindset, you know, that, that piece of really like how you look at the world, how you look at money. That's good. But don't let the strategies that he's talking about, which are his specialty, right? And he even talks about, if you read enough of his books, he talks about even the oil and gas industry, he was working on an oil rig, right? And he was working in the oil industry for years before he even tried to invest in it. So don't just follow, and this goes with anybody, don't just follow somebody blindly because that's their specialty. That's what they think is awesome, but that's because that was their world. Don't just follow that. So it's not about the strategy, it's about the mindset and then figuring out how you can apply it in your own life. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what that book is all about. Yeah, mindset. He actually yeah. doesn't even teach you how to do anything. Yeah, like that was the only frustrating thing that I had when on uh, the second read. When that's the conversation we had after reading it together. Mm -hmm. And but we're like, yeah, but I, we want to do this, but how? Like he didn't even talk to you. Know, like so, and that's where uh, shout out to bigger this, pockets. Yeah. Shout out to yeah, a wheelbarrow profits was one of the first ones I read. Uh, but yeah, just consuming books and uh, you know knowledge and getting questions answer from mentors and uh yeah it's uh, and, uh, and I'm, we're still uh making mistakes and and getting better there's there's no limit to the learning there's no limit therefore to the amount of wins and gains you can have uh a def definition of a winner is the guy who failed until he finally figured it out you know so mm -hmm. and that's uh well kind of and that's one thing you remember about kiyosaki too i mean I, again i don't want to trash talk him but like if you listen to his podcast lately he is not the same kiyosaki that he used to be you know he's He's kind of gone a little, little out there a little bit with some of his uh, his conspiracies and whatnot, right? So again, be careful. Um, be careful who you listen to. Take everything with a grain of salt. Take us with a grain of salt, yeah. right? But yeah, just be careful because I mean, if you followed his advice for the last couple of years, you would probably be broke right now because he he, uh, 
He does. He's saying the market's going to crash like every year. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, market's going to crash. Is. You know that uh, you know you should be investing in Bitcoin when it was at sixty five thousand and it came crashing down oh, or really? whatever else. And oh, wow. I mean, he's 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 made so many predictions that haven't gone well because now he's just kind of flying on. You know, he's he's getting older, right? So yeah. It's, yeah. You got to be I careful. I actually met him at a conference. Uh, yeah, he has gotten older. Really cool guy, but you know it's hard to you know be that still that sharp. And uh, he has gone a little bit on the, you know, like fear on like it's going to crash. He's buying a lot of gold, silver, you know, those kind of stuff, and yeah, oil, gas, and things like oh, that. Yeah. I mean, I don't even think he's bought. I mean, he doesn't do uh, any real estate. He just gives his money to uh, uh, Ken McElroy. He invests in Ken. <laughs> Kenny, he's he's a G. That's the way. Uh, but even Kenny hasn't uh, bought any in the last uh, two or three years because of the. The multifamily going a little bit hot, you know. So oh, really? not a, that's why uh, rich uh, left multifamily, start doing hotels. Mm -hmm. So I think Kenny will be getting back into. It was getting too saturated. Is what you're saying? Yeah, it's just the the people are just outbidding too much. Fifty offers, mm -hmm. you know, it's just getting ridiculous. There's mm -hmm. no yields. I mean, I did a deal. Of, right. Know, that's freaking. It's all variable rates, so it's already super risky. Yeah, at least we got it fixed for. Uh, so for people who are listening, there is nothing, no such thing as a thirty year fixed. If you buy anything five units or higher, it's very difficult to get that. Mostly it is variable, and you can fix it for five, seven, or ten years. So. A lot of yeah. those loans do come due. And if you got it at 2% in 2020 and it's due now, you're going to lose the property 100%. We talked to Rockstar Capital, uh, R Robert Martinez, I think. Yeah. And he lost a $51 million deal, uh, gone. And so $20 million in equity just disappeared. So wow. that's just crazy. Right? And he's a, he's a, he has like 1,000 units. He's not like, oh, I yeah. just bought it yesterday. So. You have to be really careful. That's why some of the things that we did during the pandemic, people were really like, oh, you should buy hotels, buy this, buy stores. Yeah, we would have lost all of those because, you know, uh, it's not fixed rate. All of our properties are fixed rate. Yeah. 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 yeah so at least we're, our, our risks are somewhat mitigated. Yeah. Not accounting people for People pay rent, we're fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. You know, there's no significant plumbing or roof, you know, but yeah, yeah it's inevitable. And that's why I say have that cushion. Uh, plan for the worst, hope for the best, you know, and I would say, and in, in something I do want to uh, reiterate that we've kind of touched on is people is everything. I mean, from mm -hmm. what you're saying, like networking, being in that right room, uh, having that, those relationships to learn from uh, huge, who you partner with, you know, there's no, I probably have like three houses, have maybe, three, at least three maybe houses. three houses, two and a half. If I didn't know this guy straight up um, <laughs> and uh, you know, now we're at 10 million. Uh, and uh, nice. vendors, you know, who I treat my vendors like gold. In fact, we're going to actually host a party here. And this is his you know, the house here in the backyard. We got a grill. I'm literally going to invite all of our local vendors uh, in the area. Say, hey, we're going to grill and chill. You know, some cervezas. Let's rock and roll. All of our cleaners, landscapers, just for like a couple hours, just to show our appreciation. Um, and, um, and, you know, and, and goodwill because they've taken care of us. And so finding those great people and holding on to those vendors, you know, especially let me just give you guys a freebie on if you have furniture rentals like we do, the cleaner, oh, you find the, the cleaner, you treat them like gold, man. So uh, anyways, uh, and then on top of that, your tenants and guests that you accept, you know, uh, for our furniture rentals, we have a threshold. We just don't go under. I'd rather it sit there then go uh, under a certain rate because we've done it time and time again. And we'll attract those types of guests who will come in, party, trash the unit. And uh, you're in it, you know, you try to get emotional about it, but whenever you're there to set it up and you're running it, it's your baby. It's devastating to see those pictures from your cleaner. You're like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. You know, here's an extra 20 bucks. Um, and then of course your, your tenants, I'd say almost even more importantly, who you're screening, your screening process, the 12 months, like make sure those are the right people. And uh, again, I'm just kind of giving more and more value out of you know, just my head here, but uh, inheriting tenants. Inheriting tenants has burned us a little bit. So, you know, doing your due diligence on the property itself, but also let's see those rent rolls. Let's see the, yeah. let me see the tenant myself as if I were uh, screening them and bringing them in for the first time. And these are tips that uh, right. I'd, I'd want to hear. But, That's important anyway. thing. Like, you're really investing in people. I mean, that's what you're yeah. really saying is that, you know, no house writes you a check, right? No, it doesn't yeah. matter how awesome the house is. It's not the house writing you a check. It's people behind it. 
Yeah. You know, so whether you're paying the cleaner or you're you're working on the you know, find the right tenants, it's always those people and always going back to the like the key economic thing that will always solve your money problems, which is how do you go about providing more value for more people, right? How yeah. do you provide that win-win? How do you create value for people? If you always focus on that, you'll find out when you give people what they want, you'll never want. Yep. Yeah. Everything is value. That's how the world works, you know? And yeah. that's why I think that uh, Stephen Covey book uh, was a game changer when I read it years ago, because that's basically summarized as great win-wins, you know? And, and that's what yeah. I try to look for for everything. You know, making sure everybody leaves the table feeling like they they want. That's not easy, but the time and experience you can pull it off. Um, That's right. Speaking of, I think you've got this story about how you were like in a mass amount of debt. I wanted to kind of ask you about, and you dug yourself out. How did you provide so much value <laughs> that you were able to get out of uh, that hole? What was happening? How did you get into the issue? And then how did you get out of it? Yeah. So 2006, you know, that's when I was first getting out of the rat race. Uh, I realized I wanted to have a bigger purpose, right? Like I, I got to that point of, oh, I can retire. You know, I'm work optional. Now what? And, you know, and of course your other friends in their twenties, they're not, they're, they all got jobs. So I was trying to figure out what to do. I was getting a little bit antsy and the opportunity finally, finally came up. I started a company with some other partners, not my current one, not money ripples, but one that I did before. And uh, they were like, Hey, let's, Let's uh, save the world, so to speak, right? Like, let's let's teach this whole passive income thing. And, you know, one of them had like all these different phases and steps that went with it. And so 2007, I came out of retirement. Now, while I was doing that, of course, he was saying, hey, this partner was saying, hey, listen, I need you to be a team player. Cut off all these streams of income. So one, he's like, you know, get rid of all these extra streams of income because I had other business streams coming in too that were I was very part-time doing. And uh, he's like, cut those off. Like, be focused just here. So mistake number one is to cut off streams of income. Um, two, I started sinking a lot of money into, into the business as well. And, uh, and so by mid-2007, the people we were teaching were all flippers, right? They were just real estate flippers oh, yeah. who were going broke by mid-2007. So it was like the perfect storm. But like At least everything period. worked out in 2008, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it didn't for us. That's for sure. I mean, we were, <laughs> we were almost bankrupt even in 2009. Right? Oh, yeah. we, we were barely holding on, you know, and... And so during that time, like when I was no longer out of the rat race, I was back in, I just couldn't teach getting people out of the rat race anymore because I was in it. And I, I, I'm, I'm a horrible BSer. I cannot teach something I don't do. Mm -hmm. And so I started teaching people how to do what I was actually doing, which was how to find money, right? How to get resourceful. So I pivoted, right? And, and they were still kind of teaching their own thing. But I started teaching my thing within the company, which was how do you improve your cash flow? when you don't have any, because I mean, I, was, I went from, like I said, millionaire to upside down millionaire. Like I was in the hole, like over 15,000 a month between my business and my personal expenses compared to what I was making. So I was short 15,000 plus a month and my real estate was depreciating, you know, and everything else. I mean, heck, my wife was threatening to leave my wife at that time. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I'll just take the kids and move in my sister's basement until you figure your stuff out. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, that's the worst thing you can do. I'm already feeling like a fraud and I'm depressed, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so I had to just teach what I was doing, which was find money. And the reason is because people come to me, they say, before I was doing this, they say, Chris, I would love to hire you because I want to learn about this stuff, the creative stuff of money. But uh, honestly, I just don't have the money. And in the back of my mind, not verbally out loud, I would, I would say in the back of my mind, man, their situation is way better than mine is. I suck. You know, I'm broke. And so I would tell them, I said, listen, if I can help you find the money to pay me, will you, will you pay me? They said, yeah. And that's how it started. Like, it was just how do we find the money? How do we like get them to like start tracking their money? Because I didn't track my money when money was coming in, like, like air it was so overly abundant. I didn't track my money when it was gone. Then I was tracking every penny. Right. Mm -hmm. So I started tracking my money. I was telling them, track your money. I was telling them, here's creative ways to pay off your debt. Like I, I use a system called cash flow index that I created that looks at debt like an ROI, like an investment versus just going for the highest interest rate or the lowest balance. I go based on what's the payment to the balance ratio, right? Which one is going to be like, if I pay off something, what's going to give me the best ROI? You know, it's like if I have two different loans. One's a $10,000 credit card. One's a $10,000 car loan. Most people say, well, pay off the credit card. But what if that car loan was 500 bucks a month and the credit card was only 200 bucks a month? If I want the best ROI, 
I'm going to pay off that $500 a month car loan, regardless of the interest rate, because that's what frees up the most money. And how did I learn that? Because I was broke and I needed cash flow coming back in. How did I get out of that hole was which debt can I pay off that will have the biggest bang for my buck? And so I created that cash flow index formula, right? You know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, and, and then just taxes, like tax savings. And we even start, you know, meeting up with accountants and having them work with their clients. And, and pretty soon, like our average client was freeing up like $34,000 a year without investing a dime, right? And, uh, and that's, that's when I realized, especially when I was teaching some of these strategies and people were starting to find money. I mean, one guy actually was bawling because he found out he was overpaying in taxes 50000 a year. And so oh. as a result, I'm like, I think I'm onto something pretty good here. And it actually changed our entire, really the trajectory of our company. We were almost bankrupt in 2009. And by 2010, we'd made over $5 million, you know, that next year. Um, and that's what I did, you know, and so I was teaching that stuff. Uh, I eventually left in 2012 to start Money Ripples. Um, and I let them use my old stuff. They still teach my old crap today. Even though I've redone it, they still teach my stuff to this very day. That still and, works. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, it still works. I still hear people say, oh, yeah, I got good value. I'm like, man, imagine if you worked with us. <laughs> it would have been even better. You know, they're teaching my old stuff, you know. But uh, but that's but that's the thing is like, you know, once I got into like the mid 2010s and even though my credit was shot, I started to get back into investing again in real estate and things like that. Then I started bringing the passive income element in as well. And so it wasn't just about trying to free up cash. And that was about how do we get our money working harder for us? So we don't have to keep yeah. working hard for money. And Free so that's time. when I started, because once I started doing it, then I felt like I could teach it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you found where you can give the most value because you were living it and doing it and teaching it. That's awesome, man. Way to pivot. Yeah. And, and the got, great thing is it helped me pay off my debt too. <laughs> yeah. And so this company you have is, it's it's called Money Ripples, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Correct. what is this company? Uh, what does it do? We do two things. And we only, and my, my mantra in business is this, is that if you're not going to be the best, then don't do it. You know, Love that. that's the, that's kind of, I think is it, because honestly, it's, you know how it is. Business is hard. You know, I'd much rather refer to somebody else as the best than to have to try to become the best. So we became the best in two things. One is passive income consulting. So those people that want to be passive investors, but they're trying to find like, how do I get some guidance, like in direction of how do I use my money to create more passive income? And, and by the way, are there some vetted deals out there that I don't have to go searching for, right? Like I said, in the beginning, you can either create your own network, like over 20 years, like I did, or you borrow somebody else's. And so a lot of our people will borrow my network to say, hey, do you have people to invest with? We're not investment advisors, but they want to be able to have somebody kind of guide them along that path. So we do passive income investing is one. And then the second thing is what we refer to as that strategy, max ROI infinite banking that we do specifically for real estate investors, business owners, people that want to get really get their, their investment money to pay them twice when they do their real estate investing or their businesses. Is that through like a wholesale product or some kind of life insurance product? Yeah, it's through life insurance. Exactly. So we actually have a life insurance license. I, honestly, actually, I never dropped my life insurance license in the last now 22 years I've had it. So I've always had it. I was always referring it out when people wanted to do that strategy of how do they get their investment money to pay them twice. But um, when I realized it was actually in 2017, after I retired the second time, and I was kind of wondering what the next stage of my life was going to be. I was still doing my Money Ripples podcast, but I wasn't doing much else. Um, I remember somebody kind of pulled me out of retirement and said, Chris, you've taught me this. Like, why can't you do it? And I said, yeah, I hate paperwork. I don't want to deal with that kind of stuff. I don't have to deal with underwriting, you know, all that kind of you know, thing. And um, so he finally convinced me. He was actually another podcast host. He finally just convinced me. He says, okay, Chris, what do I have to do? Because the guy you refer me to, he's a nerd and he's not the kind of guy to teach people. So how do I get you to do it? And finally, I said, well, let me look into it. I spent a couple hours on a Saturday and I found out I was able to do it better than the guy I was referring to for years. Even though that guy had supposedly perfected it, he was still thinking about his commission. So he wasn't always doing just the best thing for the client. And that pissed me off because the truth is like, if you want to get the best ROI on those kind of infinite banking policies, you want the lowest costs coming out. So that more goes to that tax free savings account to then go and invest. That's the whole point. And, uh, but he wasn't doing it. He was doing a good job, but it wasn't the best job. And that's what I found industry wide is that people out there, they're like these, these insurance agents are being insurance agents. They're trying to tell you, Hey, use this as a bill payer, throw all your money in this thing, even though that might cost you too much in fees, yep. or they might say, 
you know what? Hey, just set it in there for you know decades and then you can make money off of it. But no, it's like you can actually make money off of it from day one if you design it the right way. And so that's where in 2017, we took it over. We're like, you know what? Forget it. Like we're, we're coming in here. We're going to disrupt the industry and actually try to redesign these to make them to where those other guys are going to have to try harder to compete. Yeah, I actually have mine set up with uh, Chris. Do you know Chris Noggle? I do. Yep. Yeah, he's one. He's one. He's an awesome guy. He's a great yeah. guy for sure. But uh, yeah. we 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 kick the crap out of their policies too. With, oh, uh, really this, nice. Yeah, they have team. a pretty high cash value, very low debt benefit kind of deal. I did. Yeah, I I have some. My sister has some. I have some. My buddies. We set it up. Yeah, they work with Brent. I think Brent Kessler. Hmm. Yeah, they do good. They do a good job. Like they're, I would say they're better than average for sure. Like there's the traditional life insurance guys that are horrible. Like you know, oh, yeah, those off, are my first policy was like that, you know, that I bought from, you know, a, a guy that was supposedly a real estate investor, but he was just raping me in fees. Um, yeah. But it's funny because like I actually, uh, you know, there's a, a real estate investor that he said, hey, um, my younger brother is going to come to this thing we're speaking at. And uh, he actually just bought a policy or he's about to buy one um, actually from those same guys. And uh, and the, and his younger brother started telling me how it was designed. I said, "Oh, you're overpaying a thousand bucks a year." He's like, "No, no, no, no." He's he's doing the best job. I'm like, "Watch!" And and we even like showed him showed him the numbers. He's like, "Holy cow! Like, why am I overpaying a thousand a year? Is it better?" I'm like, "No, no. They're just making a little bit more commission because that's how they make their money. They're not like us where we're re- retired already off the passive income. They're literally have to make that money because that's their career. So." They give you a good, but they don't always give you the best because they don't want to cut their commissions back. And that's what I've heard, sadly, behind the scenes. I've heard so many of those insurance guys say. So it's not that they're bad. They're just they're just trying to find the balance. Like they're trying to like, how do I create a win for you, but still get a little extra win for me too? But the, the truth is, you don't have to do it that way. We still made plenty of money on that guy's younger brother. You know, like we still got a great plan. And he saved himself for a thousand bucks a year in costs that now could be used to invest in real estate instead. That's cool, man. How how long is the timeline for the, you know, like if you put in, let's say, 100 uh, grand upfront, uh, you know, PUA and all those paid up additions and all that stuff, does it take like, uh, I think mine took almost three to five years to break even, but I did, I was able to borrow 80 to 90% of the money I put in within 30 days. So that's what I really wanted. Right. Yeah. You want that liquidity. Uh, we generally don't recommend people dump in a bunch of cash up front. Like mm-hmm. it's better to do it gradually. Uh, for example, like I had somebody come to me, they they had a quarter million dollars. They're saying, hey, I'm, I want to invest in real estate, but I was told to dump all this money in and then invest in real estate. And mm-hmm. I said, no, don't do that. I'm like, let's take your quarter million, all of it, and invest in real estate. And even if it makes you 10% return, that's still 25 grand a year. But your emergency fund, let's diversify your emergency fund. Let's use some of that to fund your policy. And on top of that, you already have 25 grand a year coming from those investments that will fund the policy for you. So you, it's almost like a net zero cost when you do it that way. But the, unfortunately, there are some guys out there in the real estate space who'll say, no, no, dump the 200 grand in or 100 grand in up front. And then you pay a little at the very back end. Well, they do that because they make the bulk of their money in the first year. So the more you pay in that first year, the bigger the commission check becomes for them. Um, versus being a bigger check for you down the road. And so, yeah, it's true. You do want more money. Um, and and I, I usually use companies that you'll have access to 95% of the cash that after the fees come out that you have available right there. So that's that's definitely a good way to do it. You want that liquidity, like what you were talking about doing, like having those first 30 days, you do want that. But if, uh, so in my case, I had a, I think a $40,000 credit card bill, which is going to be like mm-hmm. 30% because I always run the 0% till the last day, right? Midnight, I'm right. paying it off. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that one, I figured I can either pay it and the money is gone, or I can put it. Is this is this with Lafayette? Just a bank. Put uh, oh, yeah. forty five in, and I got forty out or something like that, and paid off mm-hmm. the credit. But now I have a million dollar life insurance. So if I die, my sister gets a million bucks, but it's the same money, so I don't really lose now, right? That's that was the plan. Yeah, yeah. Lafayette's one of the companies we work with. I mean, we don't use them as much anymore because they are they've gotten more expensive and their returns are lower. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, like that's a great example right there is you get your money stuffed in, you know, and you know, and of course you didn't have full access to the money because some of it come out insurance costs right off the get go. Sure. Right. But then the remaining part, that 30,000, give or take that money you use to pay off the credit card. And and here's the thing, like you could cash it out and use just use the cash and withdraw it. But we don't do that. 
Instead, we get a line of credit against different where you pay the insurance company interest. They'll charge you about 6% right now, which is way better than 30%, right? And then you use that to do it. Now, someone might say, why would I pay interest on my own money? Because that's one lie you'll hear the infinite bankers. They'll say, oh, you pay yourself back interest. That is a 100% lie. You do not pay yourself back interest. That is not true, uh, despite what you hear on YouTube or TikTok, right? Uh, the truth is, you're paying back the insurance company like they're the bank. They are charging you interest and you're paying them interest. But here's the key difference. So like in your situation right there where you had that 30,000 or so in that cash that you then got a line of credit against, yeah, you're paying them interest, but that 30,000 is still earning tax-free interest inside the policy, which is paying right around 6%, right? So what's happening is it's kind of washing out the interest. And if you are paying back payments like you were to your credit card, but you're now paying it back to this, what happens is your money's compounding inside the policy because you never pulled the money out of your policy. It was still there. You actually borrow the money from the insurance company's pocket instead to pay off your credit card. And the other yeah, charging interest, but as you pay that line of credit back, you start paying it down, you get charged less and less in interest while your money compounds more and more. Even if it's the same interest rate, let's say they're both 6% you're being charged and you earn, you might think, well, there's no benefit. There is because that compounding interest goes up more than the simple interest you're paying. And you actually come out just like banks do to you, right? They create arbitrage, right? Where they lend out money and, and they uh, charge more than what they pay you in a savings account. Same thing. You're just doing it with a little bit different strategy. So that's, that's the beauty. That's, once I learned that, I realized, wait a minute, I could actually make money twice. I could still go do buy an investment property, put a down payment on a property using my own personal bank here, right? But... Then the cash flow I have that comes in to pay back that line of credit. So what happens is I'm earning money inside the policy, inside that cash value tax-free account. And at the same time, I'm still making money on the rental too. So I'm actually making money in two places at the same time when I do it that way. Love it. Hope everybody was taking notes. <laughs> Nobody understood that except you and me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 100% I can bet money. Andrew understood 10% of that. Tell me the truth. Andrew. 12. Well, he got 12. You know what? <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. And, well, we got master classes on our Money Ripples YouTube channel. You guys can watch where we, we talk about that a little bit. Nice. Awesome, man. Thanks, man. We don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, uh, how do people get in touch with you, man? Yeah, well, like I mentioned, you can, you can always follow us at moneyripples.com or you can follow our Money Ripples podcast or our YouTube channel as well. Pretty much just Google Money Ripples. Pretty sure you've got that name on lock. Well, thank you so much for your time. You've been inspiring, educational, and, uh, and motivating. And hopefully the audience listening got a ton out of it. I know I did, and I've been in the game for six years. So thank you again, man. Absolutely. Thanks for it's clocking in late, man. I know it's past nine at Nashville. <laughs> yeah, it is right now. But uh, oh, hey, get out there. Get it. Get out there on Broadway and have yourself a good time tonight. One, one for me. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Thanks. Good stuff, man. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. This is going to yeah, be a good, uh, good, good podcast episode. I like it. Good uh, 75 minutes. You know? I don't know about you, but I definitely like to see five star reviews on any service or any product before I purchase. Please take a second to leave us a five star review, whether you're listening to it on Apple, iTunes or Spotify or whatever platform. Take a second. It goes a long way. Helps us a lot to grow the channel. And thanks for listening.